pleasure to, uh, to be with you this afternoon. Um, given how hot it is outside, maybe we're lucky being inside uh, today. I want to make three, um, three points before I begin my talk, which is about the question of inclusion and Islamist playing in politics. Um, I remember um, some years ago, I was, one of the times I lived in Cairo, I was visiting with a friend, uh, a scholar by the name of Fawaz Yergis, who uh, is now in London. In fact, you're going to be with him tomorrow. I'll see him tomorrow, yes. He'll say hello. And he and I were meeting, and he was, uh, he was living in a flat in Cairo, and I went to visit, and we chatted and had some coffee, and we were going out to dinner. And I said, well, what are you doing for us? And he said, well, I'm visiting with lots of uh, Islamically-oriented groups and so on. And I said, have you had much success? And he said, well, let me show you. So he took me into a bedroom. It's one of these old, um, sort of last-century apartments, you know. And the bedroom was stacked with boxes all over the place. And I said, well, what's this? Are you moving out so soon? He said, no, no. Those boxes contain all the pamphlets and books and brochures that I've collected literally from dozens, hundreds, in fact, of groups that I've visited. And um, I've mentioned that anecdote just to provide some sense of the diversity of the, of the Islamically oriented groups that one finds in a place like, like Egypt, for example, to a lesser extent in uh, in Tunis because of the restrictions of the former regime and all of that, but certainly also in a country like Morocco as well. So we need to keep that diversity in mind because there's a tendency, sorry, there's a tendency uh, to privilege, I think, particular Islamist groups. We see this with recent developments in Egypt where there was a fair amount of surprise about the strength of support of the Salafists who've been working very assiduously outside of the urban quarters and doing very well in villages and places like the Delta, for example, uh, where the Muslim Brotherhood is really not much present. So many of us, and I'm as guilty of this as the next person, would uh, sort of jump in a cab in Cairo and say, take me to the headquarters of the illegal Muslim Brotherhood in al and we'd go in and have interviews with the uh, deputy guide or the guide or whatever and have all sorts of other discussions very little attention paid to the Salafists and what they were doing uh, very much at, at the grassroots so I think it's useful to remember that and instill a certain sense of modesty about what we know and a sort of breadth of knowledge about these groups I'll come back to that in a moment with the inclusion discussion second point I'd like to make, uh, to be a little bit discursive, is about Bahrain. And this was invoked, Bahrain example was invoked by, uh, by Rami in particular earlier. And uh, I would like to uh, put a kind of sharper edge on what he had to say about Bahrain. And that is, uh, I believe the Bahrainis were actually pretty close to a deal. Uh, the king, and particularly his son, the crown prince, were in advanced discussions with the U.S. and with leading members of the Bahraini opposition, uh, not least Ali Salman, the head of Wifa, uh, uh And, you know, basically this was interrupted by the Saudis, who said, forget about it. King Hamid, of course, met with the king in Riyadh. Uh, the the intervention by Saudi Arabia was not on the request of the king of Bahrain, it was basically the diktat of the Saudis. Um, and in fact, it would have intervened sooner, but they waited a day or so so the UAE could send police so they could, they could say it was a GCC force. So uh, I wouldn't be too hard, I could be hard on the Americans on many scores, but in, in this particular case, I think basically the Americans were sort of pushing down the right path, but were basically preempted by their friends uh, in Riyadh. So I, I, I thought that was an important point to make. Uh, a third point, and then I'll get to my main topic here, the question of civil society, which I have a certain association with. Uh, I think that Rami um, 
is certainly correct in terms of the disappointing record of NGOs, human rights organizations, and sort of democracy advocacy groups. And indeed, the study of associational life in the Middle East over the last couple of de decades is very much a study of the efforts, the rather assiduous and continuous efforts of the governments to control, co-opt, intimidate these sorts of civil society uh, organizations. However, I think we need to have a more complete picture here and remember the very significant role that labor unions and labor confederations played in the recent events. Uh, or going back a few years, think about Lebanon, for example, and the strong labor federation there. But particularly in the context of Tunisia, where, of course, the National Federation not only played the leading role in fighting French colonial control, but in the recent events arguably has played a central role, but also Egypt, where the record of the past several years is a record not of dozens, not of hundreds, but thousands of labor actions. And this is Joey Beanham, for example. Joel Beanham has done a very good job uh, analyzing this. So uh, there have certainly been sectors of civil society that I think have been more successful uh, in terms of confronting autocracy and pushing for rights, at least for selected segments of the population and so on. And of course, one, uh, one cannot leave out associational groups that are associated with particular religious organizations, whether they be Christians, Muslims, or whatever, which provide a very significant component of civil society if it's, um, if it's uh, uh, defined with any kind of analytical integrity, in my view. Now, let me get to my topic, which is the question of inclusion. Um, it, it's always seemed to me that uh, there was a sort of commonsensical aspect of political participation. Uh, if you go back to Sam Huntington's writings, for example, you find discussions of this. And that is that as people are brought into the political process, if it's a participant process where there's a fair amount of give and take, if you wish, call it a democracy, but maybe not even a full-fledged democracy, uh, they're necessarily faced with the need to, uh, to make compromises, to be pragmatic, to make choices. Um, and it seems to me that's a, that's a completely unexceptional point if you're making it in regard to Latin America or Europe or North America. For example, here at Harvard, if you look at the uh, book by Bob Putnam, by Robert Putnam of the Poli-Sci Department, uh, Making Democracy Work About Italy, he makes the point in there at several stages how people who were at the ideological flanks as they were brought into the political process were pulled in a much more pragmatic direction and moved much more than those who stayed out of the process. So that's always seemed to me to be fairly fairly uh, obvious. Um, some time ago, these are sort of antique writings now, you have to go back to the early 90s, you look at the work of Gudrun Kramer, uh, some of my writing, uh, the work of the French scholar Francois Bourgat, we're all making the same sort of point about Islamist groups, that basically bringing these groups into the political process uh, would, uh, would likely expose them to the need to make behavioral changes in order to basically play the game. Now, I'm not talking about groups here that have a millenarian uh, objective. I'm not talking about al-Qaeda groups. I'm talking about groups that define their political goals in the context of a state. Um, you know, another person sort of got at this from a different direction is the Iranian uh, scholar and intellectual Abdul Karim Sadush, who talks about the fact that, um, that uh, Islam should stay out of politics because politics is corrupting and it, uh, it basically undermines values and undermines religion and so on. Uh, and, and indeed, this was significantly the cr uh, critique of Salafist in Egypt, that the political process was dirty and corrupt. And as you, as you know, I'm sure the Salafists were quite critical 
up until 2011 of the Muslim Brotherhood for trying to play the game of politics uh, in Egypt. Now, uh, our argument uh, 20 years ago was that the behavioral changes would come first, the ideological changes uh, may well follow. Uh, some red lines would still be sustained, but basically, uh, but basically, as people are uh, uh, exposed to the sort of mundane choices that have to be made in the context of building coalitions and so on, there necessarily are compromises. I think the scholar who captured this best is probably Dankwart, the late Dankwart Rustell, who wrote an absolutely seminal article in comparative politics. I think it was actually the first issue of comparative politics in 1971, in which he talked not about democracy, but democratization. And he very much emphasized that becoming democratic, that democratizing, was a process of habituating to democratic rules, getting used to the rules of the game. So basically, this is an iterative process that plays out over time. I think that's a very sensible way of thinking about things. It's, a, it's an approach that's discussed in a book many of you probably read, Hassan Salami, edited by you, Making Democracy Work. You need many Democrats at the beginning of the process. Maybe the process imbues people with a kind of commitment to a certain kind of pluralism and participation and so on. So uh, I would argue that what we've seen play out uh, in a significant number of cases in this so-called Arab Spring, I would prefer Sahwa or Awakening, but in this sort of period of incredible and inspiring, in many cases, upheaval, is a kind of confirmation of the validity of these arguments about inclusion. And this has happened at a time of very significant generational change in the Middle East. You know, when we think of, when we think of from an Islamist standpoint, the pioneering generation, this would have been the generation that came of age in the 70s and 80s. You know, this was a generation where you have, uh, we have women uh, donning the hijab in families where this wasn't done previously and so on. Uh, well, you know, that generation is behind us now. There's a, there's a kind of level of public piety in the Middle East, particularly among younger people, which I think is quite striking. So this is a context in which many, many issues about religion and spirituality and piety and so on are now very much taken as given. So obviously the context is, has changed. And there's another generational element too that's very important, and that is the extent to which what we are witnessing in the Islamist groups is precisely a generational struggle. And I remember um, in the mid-90s I was interviewing the uh, there, he, he's now dead, Ali uh, Hudaybi, uh, who the, uh, was then the Supreme Guide of the Muslim Brotherhood, asking him about the upstarts in the Hezbollah Wasat, the party of the center. And he was furious at these people challenging the authority of the Ikhwan and so on. And what was behind this in significant measure was a different generation with a different worldview that didn't take the same givens as givens and so on. And it was not just the Hezbollah Wasat, but within the context of the Islamic street uh, as well. Um, one of the reasons that I would argue the inclusion argument uh, makes a lot of sense is that to the extent that political leaders are leaders, they need to pay attention to constituencies. And, and they need to pay attention to what their constituencies seek. In other words, this is the kind of question, was it Roger who was talking about it? Uh, I think, and maybe, maybe, maybe it wasn't Roger, but, but, you know, the kind of question that needs to be answered by leaders, whether they're Salafists or Hezbollah Wasit people or Juan people in Egypt or wherever, is basically how do we justify our rule? You know, how do we meet the demands of people who are looking for jobs and who have legitimate gripes against the past regime and so on? And these constituencies, I think, uh, matter quite a bit and help, uh, I, I don't think I quite share Rami's uh, optimism about where things are going to end up, but I think help to imbue the current situation with a certain element of hope and a certain element of, uh, of, uh, of uh, if you will, uh, possibility 
that may well lead in many instances to a somewhat, somewhat more equitable and somewhat freer life uh, for many people uh, in the Arab world. And I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much.